Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to go over the asking for help section. So introduction, along your programming journey, you will inevitably need to ask questions in an online coding community like ours or in conversations with your colleagues. While asking questions may seem rather simple, in a programming environment, it is essential to ask well-formed questions which as much con with as much context as needed so you can get the most out of asking for help. In essence, help others help you. The lesson will provide you with the tools to effectively ask questions in communities such as our Discord chat, Stack Overflow, and in the workplace. <clears throat> lesson overview. This section contains a general overview of topics that you will learn in this section. Explain techniques for asking programming questions. Explain and avoid the quantity qualities of bad questions. Ask effective and well-formed questions. Tips for getting the best help possible. Always provide your code and the surrounding and the surrounding context. You can ask theoretical vague questions, but you're not, you're going to get theoretical vague answers that probably won't help be helpful to you and cause frustration on both ends as you are as you and the person helping you dance around the real issue. The only time code the only time code doesn't need to be provided is if you are asking a purely conceptual question outside of a specific project or code snippet. Additionally, provide as much context as is necessary and zero in, in on the specific problem, such as pointing people to a specific function or line number in your code so, you, so people can give you the most relevant answers and quickly assist you. Ask about the problem at hand, not the solution itself. A lot of learners ask exactly how to approach a given task or assignment in the curriculum, such as below. How do I complete step five of the rock, paper, scissors assignment? <clears throat> Keep in mind that you're actually supposed to figure out how to solve the assignment yourself, and figuring out an approach is essential to your learning journey. A much better question might look like, hey, I'm trying to return a string that displays the winner in rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> but I'm getting a syntax error on line 12. Can I fix this? Here's my code. In sharing your attempt, people know what you've tried and won't suggest things you might not have worked out for you. It also allows them to debug your current iteration of code rather than spending, uh, sending you down a path that has you start all over again when you might be very close to a solution. Now, if you're completely stuck with where to start, it's completely fine to let people know that you're stuck. Asking where you can start and what you can research to get on the right track empowers you to be able to resolve issues largely on your own in the future and might even empower you to help others with the same issue later on. It is also recommended that you share your pseudo code, pseudo code so people can nudge you in the right direction or correct any misunderstandings you may have. Don't take asking more context to heart. People who volunteer in coding communities are here to help, but a question you may feel is coherent and obviously obvious probably isn't if you are being asked for more context. While something may seem obvious to a beginner, it's some, sometimes nowhere near as obvious to an expert. An expert knows <coughs> about many, many more situations that could cause an issue someone is experiencing and would want to refrain from sending a learner down the wrong path. People take time out of their day to help, so make it as easy as possible for them to help you. Here's, there's probably a good reason why they need <clears throat> more information, so trust your judgment and experience when they say, when they ask. Many people who help in coding chats are unpaid volunteers and are in no way obligated to answer your query. But because they truly do want to help you, they will ask for more information when needed. So here's your assignment. Read and bookmark this amazing article by Gordon Zhu. It's a great reference to, reference to refer to whenever you find yourself needing to ask for help, and you might find yourself solving your own problems as you think about points listed in this article. The video linked in this article is no longer available, but that is not an issue since we explain debugging in detail later in the curriculum. How to be great at asking coding questions. Print this out, read it now, then post it on your wall. Each time you have a question, read this again until it becomes second nature. The situation. Most people are absolutely terrible at asking questions, but the good thing is that you can follow a few simple steps to be great at it. Whether you're part of a team on Stack Overflow or a student at Watch and Code, asking quest good questions is essential. People that ask good questions are more effective because they get better answers more quickly and more often. 
They're also taken more seriously and get more respect, which matters if you care about your career. <clears throat> Good questions, save time. Bad questions, waste time. Bad questions create unnecessary back and forth quest- conversations, which create fr- frustration and conflict. People that ask bad questions get frustrated because they can't get help. And people who, that are trying to help get frustrated <clears throat> because answering bad questions is so damn frustrating. Bad question askers usually don't get far in their careers. They're, that's because working with them is pure frustration. If you were a manager and had to fire someone, you'd immediately think of people that ask bad questions. The only thing that saves most bad question askers is that everyone around them is bad too. And so in relative terms, they look all right. Okay, Gordon Zhu. The process. <clears throat> Understand the code to the best of your ability. Yes, actually do this. Do not rush this step. Go through line by line and figure out what each line does. Take notes. Think about the things that might be confusing. Let them sink in. Google unfamiliar concepts. You want to avoid asking a question that you can figure out on your own or with a quick Google search. Use a debugger to help you. If you don't know how to use a debugger or don't know what that is, watch the video below. Well, we don't have that, so we'll ignore that for now. Clearly describe the problem. Explain the context. For, for example, if you're a student at Watching Code, provide the URL for the associated learning and explain that you're trying to do. If you have a question about a video, provide the timestamp too, so you so that someone trying to help can reference the exact place where you got stuck. Explain the exact steps you took to produce the problem. For example, did you click the three b- buttons in a specific order? Did it work fine in Chrome, but not in Safari? Explain every little step. Explain what you expect to see. Explain what you actually see. For example, if there's an error message, share the entire error and and the line of code that caused it. If there's a weird user interface problem, take a screenshot. So that's number two, clearly describe the problem. And now we have number three, provide the code that illustrates the problem. If you are working on a larger project, isolate just the part that is broken and share that. When you share code, make sure the code doesn't change by the time you someone looks at it. That means you you should create a separate copy of your code just for your question. If you change the code, by the time someone looks at it, your question is not just a bad question, it is inaccurate, which is the worst, worse than bad. That's because everything might have changed, but there's no way to, uh, the way the person answering will know about it. Do not punish people that want to help you. So that's number three, provide code that illustrates the problem. And now we have number four, make sure the code you're sharing can reproduce the problem. Take the code you shared and make sure it behaves exactly like you described. If you share broken code that doesn't replicate the problem, it will be impossible to help you. Okay, so make sure the code you're sharing can reproduce the problem. Number five, format your code consistently. It doesn't matter what style you use, just make sure that you're consistent. It makes your code easier to read. It will help also help with the next step. Number number six is check yourself for typos. Nobody wants to look for uh, look for your typos. If you can't find your own typos, you need to learn how. Just keep reading. For example, if you're stuck on a lesson in a tutorial, go back to the point where your code worked and redo the lessons. From there, making sure that your code continues to work each step of the way. If you get to a point where your code doesn't work, redo the lesson and double check for typos. If you're on a specific lesson and the code is provided, check the provided code and see if it works. If the problem... If the provided code works, but yours doesn't, then you have a typo. Now that you are sure that you have a typo, it's your job to find it. Go back methodically and figure out where you messed up. Do not waste someone else's time and ask them to do something that you should do yourself. Number seven, explain what you did to troubleshoot the problem. Come up with a list of hypotheses about the problem might be and then test them methodically. For each hypothesis, Explain what you did to test each hypothesis. During the process, you, mu- <clears throat> you might figure out the problem yourself. This is very common. Yeah, I can agree. It's very f- common that if you start thinking about why your code's not working, you'll find it. You'll find the, uh, the solution. Explain what you think the problem might be. Based on your tests and previous step, provide your best guess on what you think the problem might be. Cool. Uh, number nine, proofread your question. Read through your question and make sure you've provided everything that someone would need to answer it. Edit for charity. Edit for clarity. If you think something might be confusing, fix it. Here's an, a typo. Fix it. 
if there if you have typos in your question people will assume that you have typo in your code and like i said before other people are not your personal typo hunters that's number nine proofread your question and then number 10 send updates and remember this will not be your last question if you figured out the answer before anyone can respond then tell people so they don't waste time looking for an answer you've already found when you get it, an answer back take time to digest it carefully and fully understand what the person is saying. Keep in mind, they might not actually be right, so you need to verify that their solution works. Um, um, thank each person that helps you, and remember that they didn't have to answer your question, but for some reason, they wanted to. So that's number 10. Send updates, and remember, this will not be your last question. Cool. Good order. Good, good little article by Gordon Zhu here. Um, I think that that's really useful. <clears throat> Okay, cool. And so now that was the amazing, this uh, Gordon Zhu, uh, how to ask good questions. And now we're going to read the XY problem, which is a common pitfall both new and experienced programmers fall into when asking questions. Okay, cool. This is a short one. The XY, what is it? XY problem. The XY problem is asking about your attempted solution rather than your actual problem. <clears throat> this leads to enormous amounts of wasted time and energy both on the part of the people asking for help and on the part of those providing help. User wants to do X. User doesn't know how to do X but thinks they can fumble their way to a solution if they can just manage to do Y. User doesn't know how to do Y either. User asks for help with Y. Others try to help user Y but are confused because Y seems like a strange problem to want to solve. After much interaction, and wasted time, it finally becomes clear that the user really wants help with X and that Y wasn't even a suitable solution for X. The problem occurs when people get stuck on what they believe is the solution <clears throat> and are unable to step back and explain the issue in full. What to do about it? Always include information about a broader picture along with an, any attempted solution. If someone asks for more information, do provide details. If there are other solutions you've already ruled out, share why you've ruled them out. This gives more information about your requirements. <clears throat> Remember that if you, your diagnostic theories are accurate, you wouldn't be asking for help, right? So here's example one. Noob doesn't actually want the last three characters in a file name. He wants the file extension. So why ask for the last three characters? Okay, so yeah, how can I echo the last three characters in a file name <clears throat> if they're in a variable echo? Why three characters? Does, is that what you really want? Do you want the extension? Yes. There's no guarantee that every file name will have a three-letter extension. So blindly grabbing three characters does not solve the problem. Got it. If Angela had just started by explaining she wants to prevent others from detecting her OS, <clears throat> this could have been a much shorter and more productive discussion. Here she goes. Um, Angela. Uh, nmap o a 127. This is an IP address. Returns some lines starting with OS colon. How to change it? Look in the source code for nmap. Find how it figures out the Linux part. Then rewrite your TCP slash IP stack to not operate in a way nmap can detect. Yeah, but I don't know about the Linux system API at all. Well, nmap's fingerprint is based on the way TC slash IP stack <clears throat> works. There's no real way except to rewrite the appropriate parts of said stack. Angela, I really need to avoid these messages. Can IP tables do this work? Well, don't use OS detection or version scanning. I want to prevent others from knowing the type of my OS. Hmm. Okay, cool. So that's the XY problem. So basically... It's about getting down and really understanding your problem. Um, it's kind of like a similar context as this last one. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think that that article does a pretty good job of describing that. Um, let's move on. Check out this article from the world's most popular programming help resource, Stack Overflow. <clears throat> yes, Stack Overflow is going to be your new home if you are becoming a web developer. So here we go. How do I ask a good question? We'd love to help you to improve chances of getting the answers. Here are some tips. Search and research. 
and keep track of what you find. Even if you don't find a useful answer elsewhere on the site, including links to related questions that haven't helped, can help others in understanding how your question is different from the rest. Write a title that summarizes the specific problem. The title is the first thing potential answers will see. And if your title isn't as interesting, they won't read the rest. So make it count. Pretend you're talking to a busy colleague and have to sum up your entire question in one sentence. What details can you include that will help someone identify and solve your problem? Include any error messages, key APIs, or unusual circumstances that your, co- that your question different from similar questions already on the site. Spelling, grammar, and punctuation are important. Remember, this is the first part of your question. Others will see. You want to make a good impression. If you're not comfortable writing in English, ask a friend to proofread it for you. If you're having trouble summarizing the problem, write the title last. Sometimes writing the rest of the question first can make it easier to describe the problem. Examples. Bad. C-sharp math confusion. Good. Why does using float instead of int give me different results with when all my inputs are integers? Bad. Uh, Brackets. PHP session doubt. Good. How can I redirect users to different pages based on session data in PHP. So, okay, so bad. Android is else problems. Android if else problems. Good. Why does string equal equal value evaluate to false when the string is set to value? Cool. <clears throat> so that's the, that one. And then there's a next section. Introduce the problem before you post any code. In the body of your question, start by expanding on the summary you put in the title. Explain how you encountered the problem you're trying to solve, and any difficulties that have prevented you from solving it yourself. The first paragraph, if in your question, is the second thing most readers will see. So make it engaging and informative as possible. Next section, help others reproduce the problem. Not all questions benefit from including code, but if your problem is with code you've written, you should include some. But don't just copy your entire program. Not only is it likely to get you in trouble if you're posting your employer's code, It likely includes a lot of irrelevant details that readers will need to ignore when trying to reproduce the problem. Here are some guidelines. Include just enough code to allow others to reproduce the problem. For help with this, how to create minimal, complete, and verifiable example. Wow. Okay, cool. So again, this is a rabbit hole type situation, so we're going to keep going. If If it is possible to create a live example of the problem, you can link to it. Okay, cool and do so, but also copy the code into the question itself. Not everyone can access external files and the links may break over time. Use sta- stack snippets to make a live video or inline JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Do not post images of code, data, error messages. Copy or type the text in the question. Please reserve the use of images for diagrams or demonstrating rendering bugs, things that are impossible to describe accurately via text. For more information, please see the meta facts uh, entry. Okay, so that's an important one to keep in mind. Do not post images of your code. Do not go command shift four and take a picture of your code like that and save that. Um, Include relevant tags. Try to include a tag for the language, library, and specific API your question relates to. If you start typing in the tags field, the system will suggest tags that you've typed. Be sure to read the descriptions given for them to make sure they're relevant to the question you're asking. And then there's another link here about tags, but I'm not going to go through that now for rabbit hole purposes. Uh, Proofread before posting. Now that you're ready to ask your question, take a deep breath and read through from start to finish. Pretend you're seeing it for the first time. Doesn't make sense. Try to reproduce the problem yourself in a fresh environment and make sure you can do so using only the information included in your question. Add any details you missed and read through it again. Now it's time, it's a good time to make sure your title still describes the problem. So again, this is um, really useful stuff. Post the question and respond to feedback. After you post, leave the question open in your browser for a bit and see if anyone comments. If you you missed an obvious piece of information, be ready to respond by editing your question to include it. If someone posts an answer, be ready to try it out and provide feedback. And look for help asking for help. In spite of all your efforts, you may find questions poorly received. Don't despair. Learning to ask a good question is a worthy pursuit and not one you'll master overnight. Here are some additional resources you might find useful. Cool. So there's some more. How do I debug small problems? All these things. 
These are all useful things, but for rabbit hole purposes, we're going to not go through that one. So while asking, okay, so back to the uh, main Odin project um, assignment. So we've done the first three and we're on the fourth assignment now. So while asking for help is encouraged, it's important to avoid becoming a help vampire and be respectful of the communities or persons you are asking for help. This resource goes into depth to identify what a help vampire is, gives, you, gives those who help others the tools to empower folks to ask questions effectively and help the help vampire effectively. Cool. So we're going to read the help vampire article and then we'll do our knowledge check and well, that should be this, that for this one. <clears throat> help vampires, a spotter's guide. And this is by Amy. Uh, Interface Radical is her Twitter bio. It's so regular you could set your watch by it. The decay of community is just as predictable as the decay of certain stable nuclear isotopes. As soon as an open source project, language, or what have you achieves a certain notoriety, it's half-life, if you will. They swarm in, seemingly draining the very life out of the community itself. They are the help vampires, and I'm here to stop them. Okay, cool. The Help Vampire, a spotter's guide. Oh, identify help vampires. Identify help vampires can be tricky because they look like an ordinary person or internet users, whichever is lesser. But by closely observing an individual's behavior using this handy checklist, you too can identify help vampires in the field. Does he ask the same tired questions others ask at a rate of once or more per minute? Does he clearly lack the ability or inclination to ask all the almighty Google? Does he refuse to take the time to ask coherent, specific questions? Does he think helping him must be the high point of your day? Does he get offensive as if you need to prove to him why he should use Ruby on Rails? <laughs> if, is he obviously just waiting for some poor, well-intentioned person to do all his thinking for him? Can you tell he really isn't interested in having his question answered so much as getting someone else to do his work? Got it. So that gives you a really strong idea about what help vampires are. Note that I use he is the general sense, even though help vampires are almost exclusively male. It appears that help, male help vampire, drawn as it is to shiny technology, occupies an evolutionary niche that females of the species simply do not find desirable. Wow, that's some sexist, crazy stuff. Okay, another key indicator for help vampires is the clearly stated but impossible question. These questions look reasonable on the surface, but in fact, they are impossible to answer for a number of reasons. These questions include, for example, how do I build a form? Or how can I make a chat site? Their purpose is threefold. First, to identify a victim foolish enough to attempt to answer the impossible question. Second, to distract a victim long enough to separate him from his fellows. And lastly, to befuddle the victim's brain while their soul is being removed through the abdominal cavity by way of a standard issue bendy straw. Okay, this is autonomous behavior. Again, we shouldn't hate the help vampire or stake them. They know not what they do, only that they are driven to do it, and I believe they can be saved. How do I build a form? Help vampire use impossible questions to lure a befuddled victim. <clears throat> Okay. Signs of help vampire infestation. The chief indicator of a help vampire problem is the lack of helpfulness. The community may still appear to be bustling and lively, but if on closer inspection the conversation is all towards the shallow end of the pool with moderately difficult questions going unanswered, then a help vampire infestation is likely. Help vampires are transitory. They move into a community as soon as they sense its vibrancy and intelligence. Often they leave, give up in, the eyes, in their eyes. Often they leave, give up in their eyes. When they have exhausted all the resources, leaving the community itself drained and adrift. This behavior incurs a secondary effect which further cripples the community and persists even after the help vampire problem has passed. Often the best and brightest using the outflux of decent conversation retreat into walled gardens communities which the help vampire can rarely penetrate. In this way, the individuals are sheltered from the painful effects of help vampire attacks, but they also make themselves inaccessible to non-help vampires 
users as well. This effect can be the last straw that leaves the community devoid of experts and utterly without hope. If you're a help vampire, now you know. Stop, of course. It's not just that easy, or nobody would be, ever be a help vampire at all. Before you ask a question in a community, try to find the answer elsewhere. This way, you're, you help yourself by stretching your mind and research abilities. And you learn things more thoroughly too. Plus, it's good karma. Always try these adv- avenues first. One, keep troubleshooting. Often, we learn that it's easier to give up and ask for help rather than persisting. When we'd get our breakthrough, if we'd only delay giving up another 10 minutes, respect yourself, go a little further before giving up. Google, of course, Google partial error messages, add software names to your queries, and generally try at least three or four searches before you give it up as hopeless. Mailing lists, forums, and news groups. Chances are you're not the first person on earth to have this problem. Likely, luckily, we live in an age where we can search the past. Check out these resources next. Docs. Uh, Documentation, I think, is what she means by that. Sometimes they seem impenetrable, but give it a whack. The more you learn, the easier the documentation will be to understand and decipher. Ask your question, but phrase it differently. Instead of asking your question directly, ask, "Has has, has anyone has seen this problem? Or can anyone point me in the right direction? Likely as not, someone will have been there before and they might know a blog posting or other resource which can help you out. This way you, sh- you show you are respectful of their time and understand your problem. So your problem is not unique, probably not unique. Okay, cool. When you do ask a question, try to provide as much background detail as possible. Ask yourself these questions first so that others don't have to. What version of the software are you running? What's your operating system? What exactly are you trying to do that won't work? Is the problem uniform or erratic? What's the exact error message? What did it arise? When did it arise? What exactly don't you get? Can you provide sample code, ideally with line errors where the error occurred? And have code samples at ready when possible. And when you're talking on an IRC channel, put your code samples on pastebin. If you've provided code separate parts of the project, label them with comments. Provide a little bit of flow description to help familiarize people who don't know your code from a hole in the ground. <clears throat> Reforming the help vampire, e.g. not you. You're, you'll get good results of following this action plan for solving your community's help vampire problem. One, create resources to help vampires, for help vampires and regular folks to help themselves. Seize all behavior which enables help vampire vampy behavior. Get help vamp- vampire virus head on. Meet help vampires head on. As you can see, None of these steps endorse violence. (laughs) There are no stakes, kickboxing moves, or sneaky little ampules of holy water, although witty repartee may be involved. Okay. Uh Okay, so number one, creating resources. So I think she's going to go through each three of these. Yeah, and that looks like the, the end of the article. Okay, so number the... Reforming help vampires, uh, number one um, thing to do. If you're com- creating resources, if your community's resources are spread over all the web, not organized or indexed, and generally harder to navigate than the than a rat's nest, then creating a solid help resource should significantly cut down help vampire activity. At the minimum, create a well-organized, preferably community-edited page, which clearly edits the following: <clears throat> A. Frequently asked questions. With real frequently asked questions, no one which, no, not ones which sound likely, and with clearly phrased, actionable information for each question. An up to date list of errors or pitfalls one is likely to encounter in the current version of the software. <clears throat> list of useful resources, ideally organized by topic, installing, deployment, thir- third party add ons, beginners tutorials, advanced tutorials. Cool. That's a definitely a great idea. Some very simple community guidelines. Most people, and even help vampires, will behave appropriately if they only know what appropriately is. Ideally, resources page <clears throat> should be just that, a single page. This makes finding information easy and doesn't require a search engine. <clears throat> also, be nice. A condescending or cruel tone in resources page will be very counterproductive. Uh, 
Okay, so that was number one, creating resources. This is ways of re-helping, reforming help vampires. So number two is case enabling behavior. Secondly, you must rid the community of any thing which enables help vampires to keep being help vampires. Enforce autonomy, no matter how benefic beneficent, benef beneficent uh, you're feeling. Never directly answer a com common question that is lazy way out, and you only enable help vampires instead of truly helping them. Let the URL to your help resource be your only answer. But tell the vamp that you are happy to help if he explores those avenues of self-help and still cannot find an answer. Foster thinking. So this is another cease enabling behavior. So that was enforce autonomy. Now we're going to our cease enabling behavior is to foster thinking. Even if it's not a question you go by 50 times a day, don't answer it with a direct fix. Unless the person is a known help, no, uh, is a known non-vamp or it's a real puzzler. Answer the questions to spur and guide thought. If the help vampire resists thinking of com or complaints, give them the URL for the resource page and withhold further assistance. Okay, so that's foster thinking. Basically, help your people, help the people that you're working with to um, uh, have confidence that they can uh, think for themselves and come up with solutions. Uh, reward self-help and helping others. Thank people who ask intelligent questions and do research first, <clears throat> and people who make an effort to help others. Tell them they're a credit to the community. Be especially generous with praise and emoticons, and those who are actively reforming their ways. Help is a trickle-down economy. Cool, so help others. And, 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 and compliment people who ask good questions. Okay, so number three of this season-enabling be behavior is to be friendly. People and help vampires are much more likely to become useful members of the community if they're met with kindness and encouragement rather than condescension and spite. They may seem like nothing but one more in a long strain of no-nothings, but you stand out very distinctly to them. <clears throat> okay, so now that was uh, number two, season-enabling behavior. And um, these are the three um, reforming attempts to reform help vampires. And number three is to meet help vampires head on. <clears throat> um, okay, so number one, you're a help vampire. Call a spade a spade and help a vampire a help vampire. Tell the vamp you'll be glad to have him as a member of your community if he reforms his vampy ways and inform him that vampy ways you're talking about. This page is a good way to do that. <laughs> so send them this page. Be gentle but firm. There's no reason to yell at a help vampire because they can't help that they, what they are until they know what they are. Being cruel to a vamp is like baiting wild animals. Just continue calmly applying the technique found under number two, which is seize enabling behavior. Even if the help vampire becomes recalcitrant or angry, weed out hopeless cases. There's a small subset of help vampires who feel entitled to your entire attention, and you have no interest in fulfilling any of your needs. If you've been calm, exercised all the other techniques, and eject him from the community, this means he won't be interrupting any others exchanges in the future. The last paragraph is uh, headed with outlook positive. I felt the need to write this because I think that people are basically good and basically self-sufficient in their right circumstances. If we can only make it easy for people to be good this, and show them we mean business, we can change the world or at least our small section of it. All right. So that's the help vampire, a spotter's guide. Cool article. Nice. Okay, so now we're going to do the <clears throat> knowledge check. This section contains questions for you to check your understanding of the lessons. If you're having trouble answering a question, click it and review the material. Oh, okay, cool. This is just reviews. This just takes us back to those pages. Uh, yeah, name at least one thing or question you should always include. Name at least one thing your question should always include. Uh, context. Uh, code examples. It should not have uh, pictures of code. It should have written out code. Um, describe the XY problem. The XY problem is when somebody has a problem with doing one thing and they think that the solution to that one thing is the same as it is for another thing. And so they ask the other question, but yet what they really need to know is the initial question. Okay. Describe three attributes of help vampires. Help vampires don't look up questions, they don't provide context, and they don't uh, have a learning knowledge. Their way of 
solving problems is to ask other people to do their work for them. Uh, cool. So I think that that kind of sums up the knowledge check. Additional resources. This section contains helpful links to related content. It isn't required. It looks like this lesson doesn't have additional resources. All right. So that concludes asking for help on the Odin project. Another long one of just talking about uh, the lifestyle of what it is to be a web designer. All that stuff resonated with me and the work that I've been doing for the last few years. So I totally think this is super valuable, especially for early stage programmers. Okay, so we marked this one as complete and we'll go to the next lesson. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next one.